You're, you're all getting quiet. No, keep talking. I'm not ready yet. No, I'm, I'm kidding you. By the way, I, these things, these podiums are, are so good in the, in the microphone and the sound systems to getting your attention. I've had one of these installed in our kitchen at home for our four kids. When I step to that lectern, I'll tell you what, it's, you know, it doesn't work either there. Yeah, it doesn't work there either. Good morning and welcome to the 2016 St. Barnabas CEO Leadership Conference. I'm Ray Carter, Vice President and General Manager of WPXI, and it is my honor to be your moderator today, and I am just pleased to be here. Please stand and join me as we pledge our allegiance to this great country. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. Now, WPXI Television and St. Barnabas have had a decades-long relationship. It is one that is founded in respect for each other. We have co-sponsored the wonderful Christmas program, Presents for Patients, and if you don't know what that program is, it is marvelous. We adopt seniors and others who are in care facilities who oftentimes are neglected throughout the year unless they're at a St. Barnabas facility and they're never neglected. But in some of these situations, they don't have family members, they don't have friends, they don't have neighbors that might be checking in on them. And Presence for Patients gives you the opportunity to adopt an individual and to visit them. And our family has been doing this, I think 14 out of the 15 years that we've been here and I remember when our children were small, bringing gifts to these patients, being able to sing Christmas carols to them, and bringing a little bit of Christmas cheer. So if you can get involved in that project, if you haven't already, boy, let me recommend it. It's, it's absolutely wonderful. We've also been partners in organizing this CEO Leadership Conference, now in its 30th year. The St. Barnabas CEO Leadership Conference was initiated in 1987 by St. Barnabas CEO William V. Day. Bill is here today in his 49th year as CEO of St. Barnabas. That is worthy of applause. Now, oftentimes when I make an introduction to Jim Roddy and I'll tell how long somebody has been in their position or how old they are. Jim will remind them that he has underwear that is that old. I bet you don't have 49 year old underwear. And if you do, Jim, that's a problem. I just tell you to swap those out. <laughs> Bill gave him that pair of underwear as a gift and he still has those, that's very kind. Bill brought together leaders of industry and of communications, government and community to discuss some of the pressing issues clear back in 1987. And this forum has become a tradition and something that I hope this community looks forward to. We've been blessed over all these years to have some really terrific sponsors that make this happen. So I would call your attention to the banners on both sides of the room and I'd like to acknowledge the sponsors that we have. Arnett Carbis, Toothman Wealth Advisors, Blueprint Financial Partners, Dollar Bank, Equipment and Controls, Farmers National Bank, Fiducia Group, Geyer Construction, MMC Land Management, Mount Lebanon Office Furniture and Interiors, Net Experts, RJW Media, Shorebridge Wealth Management, Trib Total Media, and WPXI TV. We'd also like to recognize elected officials, and I hope uh, I'm not passing over anybody if there is an elected official that we don't name. And I know Kim Geyer is here, Butler County Commissioner. Where are you, Kim? Somewhere you are. She's there. She is way up in the back, like a true politician near the aisle, so she can get out. I've seen this before, Kim. Geyer Construction, by the way, has been a long time sponsor of this event and Kim has been a member of our organizing committee and just a valued friend. She is wonderful. Now we do have a few housekeeping details before this conference begins. We'd like to have you take out your cell phones uh, and turn them on to stun or vibrate or whatever you'd like. but leave them so that they're, uh, that they're in the off position. In fact, any electronic device, if you'd turn that off, except your pacemaker, leave those on. 
Uh, we will take one 20 minute break uh, this morning. We'd ask that when you see the lights flicker, that you would return to your seats. And please, just as a reminder, no food or beverages here in the Keene Theater. And if this is your first time in the Keene Theater, you're seeing one of the North Hills gems. Uh, we use this facility for live shows and movies and entertainment and contests and everything else. This is really a terrific venue, uh, and we congratulate St. Barnabas on it. Also during the coffee break and at the end of the conference, we will provide flu shots in the Valley Forge room, which is to my right, to your left, just the first as you go through this double set of doors, uh, the first room there on the left. This is a healthcare facility, and so we want to remind people to get those flu shots, and all they need from you is your insurance card. Well, the 2016 St. Barnabas CEO Leadership Conference is about to begin. The theme of the 30th annual St. Barnabas CEO Leadership Conference is Hack Attack, Tough Talk on Cybersecurity. We have one of the most impressive lineups that I can remember us having for a CEO Leadership Conference. We have those who will help us address real life technology threats facing the country and each one of our individual businesses. They'll also share with us efforts and solutions, which I think will be important, that are being developed to meet these threats. And I'd like to introduce the speakers at this point. U.S. Attorney David Hickton of Cybercrime and Cybersecurity Unit of the U.S. Justice Department. Dr. David Brumley, Director of SciLab at Carnegie Mellon University. And in fact, we should bring these gentlemen up as we tell, is, no? no. Uh, no? Nancy in the back, in the dark, says, no, no, no. I've learned when Nancy says, no, 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 don't do it. <laughs> Gentlemen, don't get up. Stay seated. I'm just going to go through your names. Dr. David Brumley, Director of SciLab at Carnegie Mellon University. Gregory Jordan, Executive Vice President, General Counsel, and Chief Administrative Officer of the PNC Financial Services Group. Matt Lavinia, Director of Operations for the National Cyber Forensics and Training Alliance. J. Keith Malarski, Supervisor of the Pittsburgh FBI Cyber Squad. And Patrick Gallagher, Chancellor and CEO of the University of Pittsburgh. I told you it was a very impressive group. So I want to share just to, before we bring these individuals up, I want to share with you a situation that happened to me just two years ago. And my company has been generous enough to set up a home office for me. And uh, they, they'd like me to work 24 hours a day. So when I leave the office, I've got another office at the house. And it is fully complimentary, just like my office at work. It looks like it and it acts like it. And it's got all of the accoutrements one of which is a really nice computer, all set up to mirror my work computer. Two years ago, while working on that home computer, I noticed a couple of oddities, um, some frozen files and some missing files. And as I tried to unlock them, there was no way to unlock them. And I thought, I, well, I must have hit some keystroke wrong. And so I called our IT people, and they asked me to look in a few important places, and I did, and they said, oh, gosh, you've been frozen out. Somebody has taken over your computer. I said, well, how? I, I, I haven't invited anyone in, and they said, oh, trust me, you did. You just don't know how. And so they were able to track it down to a group in, or a group, it could have been some gentleman in a basement for all we know, but somebody in Russia who was holding all of our documents, and I'm talking about contracts, research, legal documents, holding those hostages and they hostage and they asked us for $3,000 in Bitcoin to release it. We spoke with our corporate security folks and we went back and forth on this issue. It was not an easy decision, but in the end we looked at it and we thought, we hate to pay this, but they literally controlled a decade and a half of valuable information that I was not going to be able to duplicate anywhere else. We paid the $3,000 in Bitcoin, and as soon as we did, it was unlocked. Now, I've heard horror stories of people who have paid the ransom and not had their information returned or unlocked. Maybe, I guess, in that respect, I was one of the lucky ones. But it can happen to any one of us, whether it's an individual or a business, 
this cyber threat is real. Whether they are governments or individuals, whether they are small or large, they are a threat and they can take a business down. Our first speaker was nominated for U.S. Attorney, US Attorney for the Western District of Pennsylvania by President Barack Obama in 2010. He is Director of Cybercrime and Cybersecurity Unit of the U.S. Justice Department. Prior to becoming U.S. Attorney, he co-founded Burns, White & Hickton, LLC. And for more than a decade, he was an adjunct professor at Duquesne University School of Law, where he taught antitrust. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please join me in welcoming U.S. Attorney David Hickton. Well, thank you, Ray, and thank you all for coming. It's a great honor for me to be here. I want to commend my golf buddy, Bill, and, and St. Barnabas for the contribution that you've made over these 30 years. And I only have a brief time with you. I don't want to exhaust it by talking about my affection and, and respect for my friend Jim Roddy, who has become my lunch partner down at the office. I, I truly love Jim Roddy. I think he's one of the great happy warriors in our community and in an age where people seem to apply heat to problems and don't shed light on him anymore. I want to say that Jim Roddy has been the, uh, my model for uh, uh, engaged and constructive discourse and positive and constructive disagreement. So thank you, Jim, for all that you have done. Uh, I was really excited to get up today. This is one of those days where you don't have to set an alarm. I want to tell you that we're talking about something here which is really <clears throat> the principal challenge of our age. Uh, the FBI Director Jim Comey talks about the cyber threat as a vector in the same way that in a former era the FBI was created because of the interstate highway system where we needed a federal response to a crime stream in a bank setting where a criminal could rob banks in multiple multiple states we didn't have a response for that that is precisely in the digital age why this is such a, a pernicious threat and why we have to organize around it I want to tell you without any shame and, 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 and bluntly as I can, Western Pennsylvania and Pittsburgh is the center of the universe in terms of the response to the cyber threat. And you should be very happy to know that this distinguished panel that I'm humbly part of represents some of the greatest leaders in this country and in the world. David Brumley and the the Scilab over at CMU is largely at the center of everything we are doing. Greg Jordan has been a longtime friend of mine, an insightful leader of the Reed Smith Law Firm now with PNC Bank, and he is a national leader in trying to find uh, productive responses. We're working hand in glove with PNC on some programs that I think are going to become the model for how corporate America deals with this issue. Keith Malarski is the head of the NCFTA, which you may not know is one of the national resources and why Pittsburgh is the center of the world. It's a public-private partnership headquartered in the South Side that was created by the FBI years ago where it's sort of like Switzerland. Companies and government can go together and work privately in, in a protected environment to analyze threat streams and find responses. And one measure of why Pittsburgh is so important is this model in Pittsburgh is now being exported to New York and LA because it's so productive. Imagine something going to New York and LA off, off Pittsburgh. That doesn't happen every day. Keith Malarski is simply the best cyber investigator in the world. Every big case you hear about Keith Malarski is touching in some way or another. It's just that simple. And in Pat Gallagher, my good friend Pat Gallagher is just one of the great people in this country. He's now the chancellor at the University of Pittsburgh, but you may not know his background as head of NIST, which developed the cybersecurity framework for the whole country. It is really the bedrock foundation of how we're going to protect our critical infrastructure. And his work in this space of, of dealing with cybersecurity is as important as, as anyone's. Let me tell you a little bit about some of our achievements in the last couple of years, because I came to this job in 2010 when a little bit of this was disconnected. We certainly had assets here. We were doing some cases. Uh, I knew that we had the ability to do this, but we had to change the way we did it. This uh, epiphany came to me from a, a lunch discussion I had with John Surma, who was running U.S. Steel at the time, and Leo Girard, who was running the steel workers. And they said, you know, we know we're being, we're being hacked. We know we're losing our jobs. 
but we know so little about it and it's frustrating because sometimes we tell law enforcement and they don't talk to us and sometimes they tell us and we don't talk to them and you just need a better model for how we're going to deal with this. So on the basis of that great line from the movie, if you build it, they will come. I created the, one of the first cybersecurity groups in the country, which was based not on our caseload, but on the proposition that this was a problem that we had to get in front of. And we staffed it way beyond what the needs were. And we created a group that met every um, Monday morning uh, to deal with national security and cyber threats uh, as if the whole world depended upon it. And I can't really take credit for this idea because it really came from Bob Mueller, the former FBI director, who's one of my heroes, who said, if you're going to be good at this, the threat streams have to be anticipated. And these threat streams, whether they are national security issues or cyber issues, really are being pushed out and decentralized. We're no longer, at that time in 2010, dealing with Al Qaeda, which was going to do a spectacular attack. I mean, we still worry about that. We were dealing with the franchising of Al Qaeda and the franchising of what later became ISIS and AP and the uh, AQ in the Arabian Peninsula, AQAP. And so I took his, his, his message and followed his advice. And we built something here in Pittsburgh. Immediately after that, working with Keith and the FBI, we decided we needed to be victim centric. And our epiphany in that respect really came from helping the University of Pittsburgh, which is a case where we really feel that we sort of got our mojo, if you will, on how to do these cases. This was a threat stream, you may remember, of an individual we couldn't identify who was anonymizing his attacks and sending attacks to the University of Pittsburgh, bomb threats uh, digitally through the media so that they were exposed. We couldn't deal with them quietly. And you know we were worried about not only solving the threat, but creating a panic. We made a, we made a commitment that was unprecedented that we were going to solve that. Keith and I were told at the time we had about as much chance of identifying that actor as finding a single grain of sand on the beach of the eastern coast of the United States. But we both resolved that we were going to do it. And in a space of a short few months, we not only found him, we, we sort of pinned the tail on the donkey. We, we identified him. He was a Scottish separatist who was hiding in Ireland. We charged him. And we're still in the process of extraditing him. And he has, he has admitted it in, a, in an interview. Uh, that he gave almost brazenly to, to a European press entity. Like anything else you've all been exposed to in your life, our learning curve and our marginal curve increases. And so off that case, we were able to build other cases. And there are many, but I'll tell you three quickly. In 2014, in May, we indicted five members of the Chinese army who were hacking American companies. Not only did we indict them, but we identified and put a face on the victims. And if you've seen the indictment, we put the pictures of the hackers at the back of the indictment in their, their military uniforms for China. The odds that we could do this when we started that case were zero. If it were Las Vegas, they would have never booked it. But we knew that it was that important because we've lost 50% of our manufacturing jobs in, in this country since China entered the World Trade Organization. We're talking about a country which, as a matter of style, substance, and protocol, does not do research and development like we do, has state-owned entities, and they believe if it's on the internet, it's theirs. They do not protect, protect intellectual property the way we do. And my thinking about it at that time was this simple. If I did it or Jim Roddy did it, it would be illegal. So why shouldn't it be illegal if the Chinese army does it? And I recognized how hard it was going to be to get the case to the finish line and bring them to justice, which we're still working on. But just like anything else important, as President Kennedy said about the moonshot, we don't do that because it's easy. We do it because it's hard and it's important. And I think that case completely changed the landscape. And it happened here in Pittsburgh. Since that case, President Xi has come to the table with President Obama and made an agreement that hacking for stealing intellectual property is illegal. And we will not do it. And we have a, a framework to try and deal with that. This gave courage to our 5 I partners in the G20, which issued a COM UK, and they made the same demand of China. It completely changed the way we talk about cyber. Two weeks after that, we indicted Eugenie Bogachev, perhaps the most notorious cyber criminal in the world, and his Game Over Zeus botnet, which also had, as Ray talked about, ransomware. It was the first ransomware case done known as CryptoLocker. 
There's a $3 million reward out for Bogachev. We shut down Crypto Locker. These criminals are facile and they will morph, but that was a game changer in terms of not state-sponsored terrorism through the internet, which is what the China case was, but a criminal organized crime enterprise. And last July, we did Dark Code. Dark Code was basically the digital equivalent of the table conversation you saw in the movie Godfather in today's era. If you remember in that scene, the crime bosses sat around and one said, I'll do bootlegging, I'll do gambling, I'll do numbers, I'll do gun running, and they debated about whether they were going to do drugs. Well, in the digital world, that same thing happens. And what dark code was, was the most significant clubhouse for cyber criminals, where you had to be invited in, there was an administrator, they shared their crime uh, over the internet in a way that they tried to create a force multiplier or a fusion effect so they could hurt people. One example was right here in Pittsburgh. There was an app that you could buy through dark code that would basically take over an Android phone. And it was a 24-year-old individual who had graduated from CMU. You could pay for it like you pay for your cable TV monthly or you could pay $65,000 and buy the entire code. That is a representative type of thing that was being sold that would allow people, criminals, to take your pictures or take pictures for you, to take your communications or send communications as if you sent them. This is what we're talking about, and people are making money off these crime schemes. These are the three banner cases that have been done here. There have been many more that you have read about. Within this recitation of some of our achievements, it's also very clear that we have challenges, and that's why I'm so excited to be here today, because this is a dynamic, fluid challenge for us. I tell people in all of my outreach, if you want to join along with us, we're on a voyage to try and deal with clever criminals who hide in the anonymity of the internet, using evaporating evidence where technology changes every day and the legal platform is too slow. When we do crime cases with overseas partners, and as you might imagine, the digital space is borderless, we have something called MLATs, which are mutual legal assistance treaties, where even with our 5i partners, we co cooperate and collaborate. It often takes a year or two to get agreement where there's no dispute. Can you imagine how you're going to deal with that with evaporating evidence? We need Congress to improve our tools on that. We have issues of venue. The internet is ubiquitous. It's still the case that we often have to go to multiple judges to get authorities to do our work. That's got to change. You've probably witnessed this great debate about the question of encryption. We need you to engage on this debate. The encryption debate really is reduced to this. And I'll use ISIS as the example. The internet wasn't created in the sands of the desert, but it is being used against us by adversaries because it has been proliferated around the world. When we talk about our effort to get process and accumulate information to protect you, what we're talking about is a privacy debate that happens every day, and I am your representative, your tribune on that debate. We balance security against privacy. We are the only country in the world that goes to a neutral judge to get access to your information. We aren't reading your emails or listening to your phone conversations. Whether it's terrorist or the internet, safety that we seek for you, we go through a neutral de detached judge. But in this discussion where you need to engage, think of this. If a country like Google, uh, I'm sorry, if a country, <laughs> <laughs> how about that? <laughs> if a country like China is imposing upon Google uh, that the, in order to do business in their country, where, which is a new market for them, that they are going to comply, but they are fighting with the United States over a platform that was created by you as taxpayers through, through, through funding, uh, through DARPA or otherwise, to develop the internet or these, these features of their business. Uh, how is that right? If they are being high-horsed about per privacy, why is it that every time I go on the internet, I get a flood of advertisements for golf gear? and golf clubs. And the answer is because when I'm on the internet, I hate to tell you, most of the time I'm looking at golf stuff. <laughs> and that means they're selling my interest without my knowledge. 
And so I think as this debate unfolds, I would urge you as public-minded, public-spirited citizens to engage on that. I see my time is up. That red light is flashing, and I know we're going to have a long and robust discussion today. I just want to say again at the end, I'm very grateful to be here. I want to give you assurance that we are working hard every day, uh, not only to protect you, but to make sure Western Pennsylvania remains the tip of the spear in this cyber effort. Thank you very much. <laughs>
So one of our visions at Carnegie Mellon is to come up with completely autonomous cybersecurity reasoning systems. By fully autonomous, I mean that they can go and find bugs and automatically prepare patches that roll out to you in internet speeds, that it doesn't require this human interaction to do it. Now, as part of this vision, we've been talking about it actually for about the last 10 years. The DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, recently got interested in this area of how can we develop fully autonomous systems. And last year, uh, put out a $2 million cash prize for the first demonstration of fully autonomous, full spectrum cyber systems. So full spectrum means that they were going to give competitors a full software stack, and the goal was to find bugs in that system, automatically develop exploits that we could compromise our adversaries, as well as defend against those bugs in our systems. And they would measure these systems not just by the security, but also by their performance. And in particular, when you applied a patch, it couldn't have more than 5% overhead. So hundreds of different people tried to come up with a system, and seven succeeded in a preliminary system, and were invited to Las Vegas this year to participate in what was called the Cyber Grand Challenge. Those seven teams included people from CMU. They also included people from Berkeley, University of California, Santa Barbara, as well as large defense, uh, defense contractors, such as Raytheon SI. Now, I'm proud to say that actually CMU Tech won that Cyber Grand Challenge. It turned out that a third of the way through the competition, we had secured such a big lead that no one could overtake us. And the way we've gone about this is we've really stopped thinking about we need to defend, we need to take only this defense standpoint. We started to think about it as this co-evolution. We need to think like attackers. And since we're in Pittsburgh, I can use the Steelers analogy. Have you ever seen the Steelers win a game by only playing defense? At best, all you can do is not lose, but you can never win. You have to think this way so that you can anticipate the attacker. And so as we look to the vision going forward, we really look at four steps that we need as a society to take in order to get to fully protected systems. First, we need to start increasing the scope of the things we look at for cybersecurity vulnerabilities. Make no mistake, banking problems are huge. But when we look at the world today, we see the rise of things like cyber commands. And for those of you to, to really grasp what it means to have a cyber command, we have a Pacific command which means that there's a general in charge of any war that happens in the Pacific Ocean. By creating a cyber command, the US has recognized that this is a space that we need to be able to navigate and defend at the same level as the Pacific Ocean. What this also means is that we're moving beyond just commerce, moving into a blend between cyber and kinetic action. Cyber affects our lives, it affects our vehicles, and you may have read about things like cars being hacked, and it doesn't just stop there. There's all sorts of what are called cyber physical systems where the cyber system interacts with the real world and the real world interacts with the cyber system. And more generally, we're starting to call this the Internet of Things, where we blend computers, cars, public infrastructure into one big global network that we have to attack potentially in the future, and we also have to defend for ourselves. So the first thing we need to do is start reaching, researching how do we deal with this increased scope of the Internet. The second thing is we need fully automatic methods to go and find these vulnerabilities so that we can fix them first. This manual approach, although CMU is doing its part to raise the world's best hacker, simply does not scale against the current threat. Once we develop automatic methods to find vulnerabilities and to patch them, we need to weave these together into an autonomous system. So the difference between automatic and autonomous is really an automatic is a tool. It's you press a button, it does an action, and deploys that action. An autonomous system can reason for you. It can anticipate the attacker, and it can start reacting at internet speeds. This is what we, we showed off at the DARPA Cyber Grand Challenge, so we know it's possible. We just have to make this real. And then finally, we also need to worry about counter-autonomy. I said attackers and defenders always co-evolve. We can't come up with an autonomous system for defense without thinking about how someone's going to go after that autonomous system. And an example what uh, counter-autonomy means in chess, We've long had programs that could defeat the world's grandmasters. We all remember the big deep blue victory. These same chess programs sometimes have flaws that chess masters can exploit. They're not really better chess players, but they exploit flaws. For example, there was a Ribka chess engine that played at the world grandmaster level. And one of the flaws in Ribka is it would try to avoid a draw. So in chess, if you go more than 50 moves without a pawn move, it becomes a draw. This chess engine had a flaw where an attacker could do 49 moves without moving a top pawn. The chess engine would try to avoid a draw, sacrifice a piece, and the grandmaster could go to town. We need to worry about 
counter autonomy, where we develop these auton automatic systems to deploy our defenses and how an attacker may mislead us into taking disadvantage action. Now, the good part about this, if we can take these four steps, if we can start increasing the scope by looking at all the devices we care about, if we can make automatic approaches that really scale and autonomous systems that can react at the speed that we need, and we can really met, uh, take advantage and, and master counter autonomy, well, then we'll have finally robust systems that can't be defeated. So with that, I see I'm out of time. Thank you. He's young, intelligent, and handsome, and I'm sorry my wife is here to see that. <laughs> Goodness sakes. CMU and Dr. Brumley are to be congratulated. Um, I know we're living in a scary world uh, from, from government intervention and hacking to individuals and, and corporate warfare, uh, and it makes me feel a little better after hearing the U.S. Attorney and Dr. Brumley talk about uh, the defense and offense that we're playing in this country, so I'm, I'm pleased to hear that. Taking the podium next will be the General Counsel, Chief Administrative Officer, and Executive Vice President of PNC Financial Services Group. In addition to overseeing all of the legal functions of the corporation, he leads PNC's relations with the government, including its regulatory affair, affairs, policy, and operations, as well as PNC's ethics office. Today, he looks at critical cybersecurity from the perspective of a major bank, and think about this, with 8 million customers. That's a full plate. Please welcome Gregory Jordan. Good morning. It is an all-star panel and group of speakers today. I'm proud to be on it, but whenever I sit in the audience and uh, listen to a group of all-star all-stars on a panel, I always wonder which one isn't really an expert because there's always one. And it takes a while to figure it out but I'm gonna make it easy for you this morning. <laughs> We've got the US Attorney and CMU and Pitt, National Cyber Forensics and the FBI. I'm not an expert on cyber. But I'm here to talk really about the perspective uh, as an executive inside a big bank and how we look at cyber and how we work with all the, all the other speakers and their teams. Um, so PNC is, I hope you think, uh, the big hometown bank. I won't ask how many are customers or former customers, I hope future customers. Probably a lot of you know people who work at PNC. Probably most of you know Jim Rohr. Um, you know, we consider ourselves uh, a critical part and a proud player in Pittsburgh. But these days, we're a lot more than that. So we're now the sixth largest bank in the country. We have th more than $360 billion in assets. We still own 22% of BlackRock, which manages $5 trillion and is the largest investment manager in the world. Uh, we do have 8 million customers. Uh, we serve them through 2,700 branches around the eastern half of the country. Uh, we've got about 53,000 employees. So <clears throat> cyber is a big deal to us. Uh, cyber security is a major issue for the largest banks in the country. Uh, we are targets every day. Uh, we know that. Uh, if we ever would forget, we hear about it from our friends over here. Uh, and and that, we, that carries with it special responsibilities. Uh, major financial institutions are designated as critical infrastructure, like the power grid and other major uh, facilities and resources that support the country. And that comes with it extra responsibilities. The government has high expectations for banks when it comes to cybersecurity. Uh, the banking regulators have extremely high expectations, uh, and they regularly talk with us about 
whether we're meeting them, how we're meeting them, what we're doing, what we need to improve upon, and it's an ongoing regular uh, dialogue. Uh, there are special laws that apply to banks with regard to customer information. So Graham Leach Bliley, which has been around a long time, but in today's cyber world uh, with digital information uh, is a critical uh, set of responsibilities for a bank from a legal uh, standpoint. Uh, and uh, we, we take all of these responsibilities incredibly seriously. Uh, maybe more important than all the expectations from all of those parts of our world uh, is we know the customers care. Uh, when we survey customers throughout the country in terms of what's the most important thing uh, they think of when it comes to their bank, uh, it used to be the interest rate or the terms of a loan or whether you could get a loan. Today, by far, the number one issue uh, is this, cybersecurity. Are you safe? Is our information safe? Because as a bank, we hold uh, personally identifiable information, PII, which is just the most highly sensitive information each of us has about ourselves. Uh, we have that as part of your accounts uh, and your money, your resources. So the number one thing on bank customers' minds are those things safe? Uh, so you can't help but take this, this issue incredibly seriously. Uh, banking is based on trust. Uh, if you lose that trust, you're in trouble. We see a bank struggling with that in the news these days, and, and, and you can see how quickly things can change. So for us, if it's the number one issue for the customers and trust is at the heart of banking, uh, you can bet we spend a lot of time and a lot of money trying to make sure we can meet those high expectations. Even in a world that's really, really scary. Uh, one great thing about hearing from the FBI and from Matt and, and, uh, and, the, and Dave and the folks that are here, they really can scare you and reinforce it is scary. But I always feel better because of the amazing things that they're able to do. Uh, so uh, it, it is a, uh, a daunting set of responsibilities uh, for a bank like PNC. So what do we do about it? Well, technology is a huge deal uh, for us these days. Uh, we have more than 10,000 employees in the technology and operations area of PNC. In fact, you, you know our campus downtown with the new building and some of the older ones clustered right there at Wood Street and uh, Fifth Avenue. One of those 40-story buildings will be entirely filled with technology people within the next couple of years. It's being retrofit uh, to be a state-of-the-art, technology-only tower. And we're a bank. We hire more technology interns than banking interns these days. We have an elite cyber unit within that that has now more than 300 people. Uh, and they've come from the FBI and the Secret Service and Homeland Security, uh, law enforcement, they're technology experts. Uh, they work in a fusion center that looks like something out of the future uh, with giant screens tracking threat actors from around the world. Uh, and they're in constant communications with the folks uh, that are here. Uh, we spend 30 to 50 percent more each year on cyber protection than we did the year before. So the investments are big. They have to be with those expectations. And then we test ourselves every day to make sure we're, all of us, 53,000 employees, doing our part. There are phishing tests that are constantly going through the email system to see if our employees are taking the bait in a way that if it were a real phishing email, a hacker might be able to do some damage uh, within PNC. Uh, we have mock cyber programs that we've worked on with David and the FBI and others to test how we're doing uh, in the event of a real emergency. We lock the senior executives in a room for two days, and it's so realistic you get a stomach ache. In fact, it sort of reminded me of the War of the uh, Worlds, uh, the old uh, story, because I thought, if, geez, if somebody walks into this room and doesn't know this is just an exercise, we're going to scare the hell out of them. They're going to you know, go to the media or something. 
it's that realistic because it has to be. <clears throat> In the end, you never know if it's enough. We have to do everything we can and keep changing and changing and changing uh, and building out <clears throat> the organization to meet the ever-increasing uh, risks and threats. So uh, banking is a lot of fun despite all that. Uh, I want you to know if you're a PNC customer, uh, we are spending an enormous amount of time, money, and effort to make sure we have the very best defenses. And we are lucky here in Pittsburgh because we are in the epicenter of the expertise. We at PNC benefit from that, and we're smart enough to take advantage of it. And really, you know, there are a lot of banks around the country that have a kind of a, a, an arm's length, hands off relationship with the government. Uh, we actually feel like we're in partnership with the government on this issue. Uh, and all the, all the gentlemen that are speaking today are part of that team as we look at it. And we work very closely with them, and many of our cyber experts have come from their organizations. Uh, we're going to keep doing our part, and I'm looking forward to being with you today. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. And we do consider PNC Bank to be our big hometown bank. We're awfully proud of what that institution has meant, not only for our community, but for the country and the world. They have 8 million reasons to worry about cybersecurity. Maybe even better put, they have 360 billion reasons to be concerned about cybersecurity. Our next speaker is the Director of Operations for the National Cyber Forensics and Training Alliance. He oversees public and private sector information sharing and analytical programs. He's also the Alliance's interim president and CEO. Prior to joining the Alliance team, he spent 26 years in the US Secret Service, leading criminal investigations in Pittsburgh, New York City, and at Secret Service headquarters in Washington, DC a founding member of the Department of Homeland Security. Our next speaker is Matt Lavinia. Thank you very much. And uh, I want to say I'm, I'm very uh, honored and yet humbled for, uh, to be here today. Uh, you look at the panel as, as uh, they're introduced here. And it's, uh, it's amazing to me. I've, I've gone to conferences, I've been on panels, uh, you know, all over the world. And this is not arguably, it is the best panel I've ever seen. And none of them had to travel to get here. <laughs> they all got up this morning and walked out of their house, got in their car and drove here. That's amazing to me. Uh, it really is. And, uh, and you should be very, uh, uh, very proud of, of the work that's being done here in Pittsburgh in, in relation to cyber. Um, and I'd say that that has not happened overnight. Um, it just doesn't happen overnight. Cyber didn't happen overnight. The internet didn't happen overnight. Um, it, it, it has taken a lot of time. And, and I'll take you back to the late 90s and early uh, 2000s. And it was here in Pittsburgh, uh, thought leaders in industry, and government, uh, being the FBI, uh, were together. And uh, there was a, a high-tech crime task force. And the challenge was industry um, working, uh, working more or less with uh, government and with law enforcement and providing information, whether it's referrals or complaints, uh, criminal complaints or victim complaints, uh, and then wanting to know something more about it. Hey, what did, you know, that, that information I gave you, what, whatever came of that? And the problem was, oftentimes the answer was, well, that's classified. Well, why is that classified? We gave that to you. Uh, and so the folks here in Pittsburgh said, that's a problem, and we need to try and fix that. So how can we fix that? Can we create a task force? Well, if we create a task force, that's law enforcement. Uh, and we can't have private industry sitting in, in uh, law enforcement space, and private industry can't, uh, can't host uh, law enforcement in their space. So it took several years to come up with a solution. And the solution that they came up with here in Pittsburgh was to create a uh, neutral space, uh, the National Cyber Forensics and Training Alliance, the NCFTA, much easier to say. Um, and it's a 501c3 uh, nonprofit. 
Uh, so we've quietly been here in Pittsburgh uh, since 2002. I myself uh, came over uh, uh, permanently in March of last year. Um, and, and we work with um, industry and law enforcement together to address uh, cyber threats. And you say, well, how does that work? Well, it's my office, I pay the rent, and industry has full-time people uh, coming to my office on a daily basis, assigned there, uh, and law enforcement uh, from many agencies of law enforcement have full-time agents that are headquarters based out of DC, detailed to Pittsburgh. Uh, these guys love it. So they get headquarters time and they get to live in Pittsburgh. They don't have to live in DC. It's beautiful. Um, so they sit side by side, face to face every day. It's unclassified space. So there's no, no worries about uh, having a clearance. They walk through the door together. Every day they work together, they see each other. So there's a, uh, a, a bond of trust that's developed. Um, their goals are to identify uh, what the threats are, uh, ultimately attribute uh, who's doing it, um, mitigate those threats. So work with industry and share best practices. Here's what somebody, somebody faced this threat, they solved it, uh, and I'm going to share that with you uh, to, uh, to help you uh, put up your defenses. No place else in the world that this is, that this is being done. Um, the next piece is disruption and mitigation. So we don't want to just keep putting up our defenses and playing whack-a-mole because they're constantly going to be coming back at us. So that's where the law enforcement element, you want disruption and uh, neutralization of what those threats are. Unless there's a consequence for the criminal actors and what they're doing, uh, they're gonna keep doing it. Um, many or, uh, organizations or, or uh, companies uh, could take the stance of, we're just going to invest in our defenses, build a bigger wall, build a wider wall, and let them go someplace else, them being the cyber threats. Um, the problem with that is that they will go somewhere else for now. And when they go someplace else, they're going to hone their trade craft, they're gonna get smarter, and they're gonna get better funded because they're gonna make more money by going to your neighbor. Then they're gonna come back at you. They're not gonna stop, and they do not discriminate against any particular sector. Uh, so their trade craft is excellent. They will know everything there is to know about your company, about your um, employees, about your executives, about your third parties, about your law firms, about your payment processes. Well, why would they care about my payment processes? Because I, they're, they're going to exploit you in business email compromise and, and easily uh, uh, bilk you out of millions of dollars and it's easily hundreds of millions if not billions of dollars so far uh, that they've exploited companies in that respect. So. How do we fight this? We fight this by uh, working together. Um, companies working together amongst themselves. Uh, there are certainly perceived hurdles uh, in working together. Um, they could be um, trust is the, probably the biggest one. Um, if I tell somebody, whether it's a competitor or it's somebody in another sector or it's the government, what happened to me or something that I'm facing, what's gonna to happen to my brand? Is this going to get out? Um, and so we're very sensitive to that. Law enforcement is very sensitive to that. Um, the US Attorney's Office is very sensitive to that. Um, your past experience, you might have, have had a past experience. Well, I told somebody the, that this happened to me and nobody ever did anything. Um, well, that's a problem uh, that, that you really should take to another level. Uh, and I would argue that that's in the past and that's not being done here in Pittsburgh. Uh, and it's, I think we're, we're pretty much over that. Um, your return on, on the investment in sharing information are you should be demanding feedback. I wanna, I wanna know something about that. If I just tell you something that I know, I'd like to get something uh, in return. So I'd like to get some feedback. Um, and you wanna see results. I th Pittsburgh's the perfect place for seeing results. Um, they are setting the bar so doggone high uh, for results um, 
that, that it is the epicenter for cyber, as, as David said. There's, there's no doubt about it. Um, a challenge might be your capacity. So your, your individual companies or your organization's capacity to share information. Do you know uh, what you're looking for? Um, if somebody else were to give you indicators or give you information, do you have a team or do you have the wherewithal to, to ingest that and, and put context around it or is context provided to you? And, and can you do something with it within your organization? And if you can't, who can help you do that? Uh, so those are some of the things you should be looking at. Last challenge might be a perceived challenge, but regulation. So am I allowed to share information, share things that I know? I would argue, yes, you're sharing badness. You're not sharing customer data. You're not sharing PII. You're sharing badness, things that are happening bad to you or bad to your organization. Uh, and so I would say that the challenge is, um, the, easy, the easy answer is, let's keep it in-house and let's just take care of this ourselves and not tell anybody. It's better for us. Uh, but I would uh, argue that it is much more bold, brave, and forward thinking to uh, find a way, uh, find a trusted environment, find a trusted ear, and share that information because you're going to make everyone exponentially stronger, which is going to benefit you in the end. So my time's up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lavinia. Someone once said it takes a village, and Mr. Lavinia just proved that to be true with his organization as they help create that village of private enterprise and law enforcement and, and broker uh, the ground rules, if you will. Next up is the supervisor for the Pittsburgh FBI Cyber Squad, responsible for all cyber investigations in Western Pennsylvania and West Virginia. He and his team's efforts have resulted in a number of indictments and takedowns of cybercrime operations. He is an 18-year veteran of the FBI who has worked undercover on cybercrime assignments. Here to discuss these organized crime groups and cyber espionage is J. Keith Malarski. Good morning, it's, uh, it's great to be here today uh, to talk a little bit about the landscape that, that we see out there. Uh, you know, I'm sure everybody uh, reads in the news and it seems like cyber, it's, it's always the flavor of the day. I mean, this past week we heard about Yahoo, 50 million records getting hacked. The week before that we heard about uh, Colin Powell's email being hacked. The week before that, we heard about the World Anti-Doping Agency and the, the athletes' information getting hacked. It seems like every day we hear about this new cyber crisis that, uh, that's out there. So, so, I mean, so let's think about this, um, of, of how we got to where we are now with the internet. Um, being a, a child of the 80s, uh, you know, I really didn't get into computers much until mid-90s. Um, you know, if you're around my age, you may remember the first, like, when uh, Windows 95 came out with the Rolling Stones theme. And then you may remember your first computer with a dial-up internet connection or maybe using AOL. And now, you know, transform 20 years later, uh, and we all have our phones. We all do our shopping online. We do our banking online. And, and our lives are completely changed. Uh, really, the internet has changed our lives quicker than any other technology out there. Uh, and so, you know, people my age, uh, you know, we remember a time before the internet, but like my, my son's age, he's, he's 15, so he's grown up with the internet. This is life for him. So we always like to say, well, cyber is something different, it's something special, but to kids uh, or the people of the millennial generation, the internet is just life. Uh, it's just, it's like air. Uh, somebody said uh, a few years ago, they said, in five years, the internet's going to go away. They didn't mean that the internet itself is going to away. It's going to, but what it's going to go away is that we will stop talking about this is something special. This is just life. So what I want to tell you about today is really how uh, organized crime groups in, in nation states have really um, manipulated this space uh, and, uh, and how they're doing business now. 
So when I started working in the FBI and I started working cyber, uh, I started thinking, well, who are these guys? Because, you know, that's what the FBI does. We do attribution. We do arrests. Um, so again, being the child of the 80s, what's the first thing I'm thinking about? I'm thinking the movie War Games. I'm thinking Matthew Broderick sitting in you know, the basement trying to hack in. You know, or, or you're thinking about some kind of geek. You know, th this is uh, uh, you know, the, the guy with the pocket protectors and the pens, and he's the computer expert, and, and, and that's what it is. Um, but it couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, what we're dealing with is really organized crime in the 21st century. Um, you know, we, we all may have watched The Sopranos, or as Mr. Hickton referred to, The, the, God, uh, the Godfather. Um, you know, we, we have these groups that are online, and they're in these marketplaces. And, and what they do is they could trade their wares and, and, and the different things out there. Uh, and it's borderless. So you could have people in, in uh, Russia talking to people in um, Africa, to South America, or to the United States. And they could all be there doing this in real time. And they could, they could attack multiple places in just minutes. Uh, they, they could hit 10 different financial institutions or 10 different companies in just minutes. Whereas in the old days, you know, our, our victims were here, our bad guys were all here, and it was all nicely wound up in a nice bow. Um, but there are no borders on this. But these guys, the, these new type of organized crime criminals, they do look at themselves still as like the mafia. Uh, and really at the end of the day, we have people behind the keyboards that are doing this. A couple organized crime groups that we're looking at, uh, you know, they, they use the same terms as, uh, as like in The Godfather. You know, we have a Godfather, we have Capo de Capis, we have Capos, we have Made Men. Uh, you know, we have organized crime groups in Russia that actually operate that I know of from an Italian restaurant. Uh, you know, and, and they're launching their stuff there. So they, they buy into the old, but then put it into the new realm. We, we even have an organized crime group that we um, worked out of here that opened up uh, a movie distribution company. So they were using all the ill proceeds uh, to use that to fund the distribution of, of movies. Uh, it's, you know, it's organized crime, but instead of running numbers and extortion and things like that, uh, they're, they're doing different types of new schemes. The money in this is just crazy. Uh, you know, we're talking about, we're not talking about, you know, thousands of dollars. We're talking about millions and almost billions of dollars that, that are in losses. Um, some of the big schemes, like the Game Over Zeus um, group that we did here in Pittsburgh, we stopped counting at $100 million in losses. Uh, and, and that was only looking at it for a few months. The crypto locker that Mr. Hickton referred to, in three months' time, we knew that they made $20 million. In the crypto locker, the ransomware is just an afterthought. You know, these criminals, what they were doing is they were doing financial Trojans to target mid-sized businesses. And then they realized, hey, we have thousands and thousands of infections of just normal people. So, I mean, it's a lot of work to maybe get the $1,000 out of Keith Malarski's account. Uh, you know, they, so they like to go after the businesses. But they said, well, we could do this ransomware. And for all the, the, com the computers that we have infected that aren't mid-sized businesses, we could throw ransomware and get $300, $400 a pop off of a normal person and make a lot of money. So, so they think business like to maximize what they have. Uh, you know, the, the other thing that they're doing is with organized crime is not just, you know, stealing money, um, you know, from your bank accounts. It could be as simple as, hey, we want to infect your computer to change the advertising that you would click on. So when you visit CNN, instead of seeing an ad for Lee Jeans, maybe you'll see an ad for Levi's. Uh, or maybe instead of an ad for Coca-Cola, you're seeing an ad for Pepsi. Um, so that's how that works. With nation states, uh, you know, when we think about espionage, we always think about uh, maybe dead drops, secret writing, encryption communications, and things like that, secret meetings and back alleys. But with espionage in the 21st century, it's much different. Um, they, they could attack you in just minutes. Uh, being online. They could steal your research and development that you've been worked on for 20 years. They could steal it within 20 minutes. Um, I, I, there was a figure that I saw, I think, um, a couple years ago that nation state actors stole the intellectual property of the United States uh, more than three times the uh, amount of data that's in the Library of Congress. They stole that in one year. Now, you may be saying as a, as a, as a company, well, you know, I don't have anything, uh, you know, of real value. Um, but you would be wrong on that. 
Uh, they, they, they want different things. In addition to your research and development, they may just want to know how you run your boardroom meetings, uh, different things like that. Um, you, may, you may say to yourself, uh, well, you know, hey, we have our best technology out there. We're going to stop all of this. Well, the, the bad guys know that maybe the enterprise may be difficult then. So what they'll do is they'll target you through your personal media. Uh, they, may, they may send an email to your personal email address. They may target you on, on Facebook or other social media. And it can be very innocuous where they say, you know, a lot of people may say, hey, I work for this company. They, they have their company name on their profile. So there may be a nice person that goes, hey, I'm really looking to get a job at ABC company that you work for. Can you pass my resume along? And it could be that easy hook just to get into, uh, into, into the systems. Um, when you're up against a nation state too, think about it. Uh, like, like Mr. Hickton uh, had mentioned or somebody mentioned, uh, the, the amount of resources that they have. If they want you, they're going to get you. They're going to get you somehow or get in there. So, so the trick is really is the, how to be able to detect how quickly they can get in. So what are we in the FBI doing? Uh, in addition to like what Mr. Lavinia talked about, working with private industry uh, to really get out there, uh, we have a couple things here locally in Pittsburgh that we do. We have a, a thing called our InfraGuard group um, that if um, it's called InfraGuard.org. If you're not a member or people of your organization aren't a member, we encourage that. And through that, what we do is we push out different types of notifications. Uh, one of the things that, that the president did a couple years ago was he allowed us to declassify um, some classified threat information to get that out there for network defense. So we push out a couple different types of products, which we call our flash messages or our, our pin messages, which is private industry notification. And we try to get that information out uh, in order to, to help you guys. In addition, we like to get out here and try to speak and interact. Uh, and as uh, Matt had said, we really have to work as this as a team uh, you know, to share that information together. Uh, so I look forward to being on the panel and answering any questions going forward. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Malarski. Uh, you talk about energy and passion. <laughs> Very impressive. Mr. Hickton called him the best cyber investigator in the world, and I'm not surprised. Our final speaker is the 18th Chancellor of the University of Pittsburgh. He has spent more than two decades in public service, including an appointment to the National Institute for Standards and Technology by President Barack Obama. He is one of 12 inaugural members who were appointed by the president to serve on the Commission on Enhancing National Cybersecurity. For the conference, he will focus on cybersecurity in the private sector. Please welcome Chancellor Patrick Gallagher. Thank you, Ray. Jim, thanks for the invitation. This is really exciting. And uh, you know, one of the uh, treats I get is to try to uh, bat cleanup, use another sports analogy. Uh, really easy job when everyone, before you just hit a home run. So uh, you know, what I thought I was going to do um, was give you a, a quick overview of some of the things that uh, we were doing uh, through NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Many of you may remember that by its old name, the National Bureau of Standards. Uh, that small agency has a big role uh, in cybersecurity. And then uh, tell you a little bit about what was happening on the commission. But I'm going to actually make this very short and then comment and try to pull together some of the things I heard uh, in the previous talks because uh, of how important it is. And I think it will give you some context. So NIST has uh, a number of roles that it plays, uh, particularly for the federal government. Uh, but one of the attributes of that agency is that it is a technical agency. It's full of uh, experts, scientists, and engineers, and it has no regulatory power at all, uh, which uh, you might think uh, would make it useless. But I would argue to the contrary, it makes it incredibly powerful. And the reason is that it enables uh, the agency to work incredibly closely with the private sector. And in fact, if it had a regulatory authority, that interface would be very different. 
So uh, NIST is the nation's measurement laboratory, and it's a place that industry and others go to for technical input and advice. And one of the ways that that advice plays out is in supporting standards. And a standard is basically an agreement on how things will work together. Uh, why is that so important here? Well, the internet itself is probably best thought of as a set of standards. It allows a very, uh, just set, a very broad set of technologies to work together and to create this cohesive system comprised of communication technology, computer technology, uh, and information processing technology. Um, and so uh, NIST plays this important role. And uh, towards the last year of my tenure as uh, director, we were directed by the president through an executive order uh, to develop something called the National Framework uh, for Cybersecurity, the NIST Framework. And we were given one year to do this. Uh, and uh, it was in the face of uh, concern that, uh, uh, that the government needed to regulate the internet. So you can imagine the backdrop here. There are a lot of skeptical industries. Uh, we were given a very short timeline. And what came out of that uh, effort, uh, really an industry effort that NIST just coordinated, was uh, the NIST framework. And what the NIST framework does is three things. It's a catalog of standards. In other words, it's a collection of best practices. Um, it's a, uh, a management model. And what it says is that the way to think about cybersecurity is not as a separate activity, but something that's baked into what organizations do, and they should view as part of their risk management approach. And third, it gave a maturity model, uh, a way of evolving from basically what we would call a low maturity organization, where you follow the rules and do it right, avoid bad things, to a very progressive and adaptive organization that can anticipate and be very flexible. So uh, the framework is getting a lot of great press and it's being widely adopted by a number of companies. And to explain why that's happening, I wanted to step back and simply ask a very simple question. Why is cybersecurity so hard? Uh, we have been struggling with this. You've seen companies struggle with this. You watch our government struggle with this. Uh, uh, we heard from the very beginning the, the, uh, the string of attacks. Every single day we're seeing uh, brand new uh, types of attacks from uh, Fitbit attacks on uh, companies to uh, major breaches with 500 million accounts exposed to governments uh, and losing critical information about some of their most important uh, uh, assets, in, including uh, national security information. And I would say there's several reasons why cyber is different. One is this is massively shared. We have taken a set of communication technologies and connected almost every person on the planet. This has never been done before. And uh, this massive communication uh, network can communicate not just uh, printed or, or verbal or video, but almost every type of information that we can imagine. So we have censored this network and are pouring enormous amounts of information. And this network is not centrally managed. This looks nothing like a telephone company. This is a mesh, an organic system that uh, can move information, break it apart, and is very resilient. This uh, connectivity then is augmented by another feature of the internet. It's massively capable. It has uh, the storage capacity uh, to store all of uh, humankind's printed record thousands and millions of times over. Um, and it is accumulating data uh, at a rate that basically doubles every three years. Computationally, it has incredibly power of powerful computers, not just single computers, supercomputers, but the collection of all computers that have been connected through this network. And that computing power is doubling every 18 months. Data. We call it big data. It's actually humongous data. Uh, it's growing uh, exponentially with a doubling time, as I said, of uh, just months. Um, and it controls and has almost every form of data we had. And one interesting thing about the data, it is incredibly persistent. This is not something anymore we can think about deleting, removing, and monitoring. Uh, almost all data is sitting there in some form. Uh, and not just the searchable internet that we think about that you can access through Google, but the underneath side that's called the deep net of non-searchable information that's there. We've heard that it's borderless. This network uh, is in fact global um, and it breaks almost every boundary we're used to thinking about, whether that's countries, 
Pri private sector, public sector, good guys, bad guys, companies, competitors, they're all connected. It's a huge commons. Um, and it means that the way we think about managing it is actually uh, uh, very difficult. This ecosystem of technologies uh, where the sum really is greater, uh, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, um, it changes all of the assumptions we might make about what does something like jurisdiction mean, or ownership, uh, or control, or retention. So all of these attributes of the internet are breaking policy. They break assumptions in law, they break assumptions in how we've done things. And so uh, that's one of the reasons you see a lot of confusion. And one of the interesting features of this technology is that it's not really best thought of as a separate technology anymore. Uh, it is a disruptive dependency. It is like air. Uh, we are dependent now on this information flow in fundamental ways. It's not just a technology that replaced something that we did manually, but we've in fact adapted to it. Um, and whether it's our personal lives and social media and how we behave and interact with others, whether it's the functioning of any one of our companies or organizations, or whether it's the operation of our entire government, they are all sitting and depending on this technology and are being changed by it. It is also something that is, uh, has a huge amplifier. Uh, with all of these things happening, a single actor can have a huge effect. This power of connectivity and automation gives this, this big advantage that we see. However, it's not true the other way. It's very difficult to have a many to one effect. Um, and speed is the other uh, attribute that really drives the speed and complexity. Not only is this communication network a light speed uh, system, uh, but its rate of change in terms of how fast it's becoming more capable and larger is something that we have never experienced before. So when you think of all of these features and you start to ask yourself, is this just hopeless? Uh, I would uh, argue that it's not, but it does mean that you have to change your way of thinking. And I think it points to a limitation in thinking by analogy to things that we've seen before. Um, one is that if we're really going to tackle the security part of this, we are going to have to do some things that uh, I would say are still weaknesses today. One of them is we're going to have to share. Uh, at the present time, uh, one of the things that gives the attackers so much of an advantage over the rest of us is that it's difficult for the rest of us to act together. We don't share risk. We don't share response. We don't share information about the vulnerabilities. Um, those single actors can take advantage of all the amplification uh, and we have a very hard time uh, working together to protect ourselves. Um, and this is not just sharing in your company or organization. This is now a very complicated. This is sharing uh, across a whole country. In fact, sharing across a whole world. And it's one of the reasons why you know, regulatory approaches and other things that are sort of defined by the borders of a country are, are a problem here. We have to actually drive practice and drive approaches uh, globally into the entire, because that's, as, that's the scale in which the internet operates. The other one is speed. The, uh, the role of automation and all of this technology capability that's built into this uh, is certainly being exploited by those who seek to do harm. Um, and you see that, you've heard from the speakers that a lot of our response is still manual. It's still people driven. Uh, this is never going to work, and in fact, we're going to see the rate of failures, if that remains true, to only accelerate. So we have to basically turn the internet back into a tool for good and turn it back on itself. Uh, there is certainly, uh, the key is going to be, and David Bromley talked about this, automation, creating an immune system uh, for the internet so that it can respond to these things and correct, not in uh, the current time frame. Vulnerabilities now close over months or years. We have to take them offline so vulnerability is a one-time use problem. This increases the cost to attackers. Uh, the incentives and the consequences of action on the internet are a big problem. Uh, we do not have uh, the kind of risk sharing, insurance markets, liability, uh, law enforcement consequences, uh, global consequences. This is too, still too immature and therefore it's really a, a, a wild west environment. Uh, that we are all seeing uh, the consequences of. And the other point I want to emphasize, because it's so important, 
it's not very uh, well matched to human beings. Uh, the internet, as we interact with it, requires us to uh, do things that are unnatural, to know too much. And we've, we've heard about, uh, in fact, Ray, you mentioned before, your, your fear that you had clicked the wrong key things, or opening an attachment, or sticking uh, a, you know, a USB drive into your computer. If these simple things can lead to these massive vulnerabilities, uh, if you need an impossible to remember password to protect something, if you need uh, to understand uh, you know, a 40-page disclosure to protect your privacy settings, you know, we have a design problem where this technology is not designed for us. Um, and one of the challenges is uh, supporting those changes. So uh, as we look to uh, what the Commission and others are doing, uh, what we're trying to do is uh, tackle those unique features. Uh, we don't want to keep doing what we've always done. We want to understand uh, the aspects of the internet that are fundamentally different and look at things like how do we share more? How do we turn this technology into our advantage? Uh, how do we look at global norms? Uh, and how do we make this uh, human friendly? So I look forward to our discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor Gallagher. The University of Pittsburgh has been such an important part of the fabric of this community, and for the last several decades, the chancellors have been valued voices, and so we are thrilled to have Chancellor Gallagher with us. I hope you noticed that each of the six who stood at this lectern, as they spoke, there was hardly a note that they referenced. This was clearly information that was top of mind and deeply embedded in their hearts. Um, as I listen to each of them, and I, I maybe fool myself into thinking that sometimes I'm a bright individual, but you listen to these six, and you are first very humbled at your own accomplishments, but secondly, you leave with a sense of security that we are in really good hands, that people are working long hours committed to solving problems that may be an inconvenience for some and catastrophic for others. So to this panel of experts, we thank you not only for being here today, but for the countless hours that you're dedicating to keeping our businesses and our country safe. We do appreciate that. Ladies and gentlemen, in a moment, we're going to take a 20-minute break. We'll have hot and cold beverages that will be available. They'll be served in the Mount Vernon restaurant where breakfast was served. We also have flu shots that will be available again through the double doors here to your left. And all we'll need is your insurance card. And in your program, you should have found a, a little note card. On that, we would ask you to write questions down of our six panelists. Uh, Jim Roddy will be doing the Q&A, moder uh, moderating that, and we look forward to that part. We'll also have uh, available microphones if you'd prefer to, uh, to stand and ask your questions. We'll have that opportunity as well. If you'll write down the questions and hand those to ushers as you're leaving, or if you can find Jim or myself, we'd be happy to take those. Uh, please return promptly, if you would, when we flick the lights after the 20 minutes uh, that we've allotted for this break. You will not want to miss a minute of the Q&A that we have planned. We will also recognize the finalists for the St. Barnabas Leadership Awards that is sponsored by our friends at Trib Total Media. So enjoy your break, and we'll see you back here in 20 minutes. <laughs>